Hi everyone, my name is Toby Megadeth. I have a data scientist at the American Civil Liberties Union, and I use Gigro pronouns. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Amrita Mathai. I also use Gigro pronouns, uh, and I am the Director of Strategy and Program Integration at the New York Civil Liberties Union. To foreground on paper, I want you all to imagine that your loved one has the opportunity to be released from parole. Before this decision can be made, the parole board has to decide what level of monitoring your loved one should be subjected to. So in order to make this decision, they turn to a risk assessment tool. And this tool takes information about your loved one, like their age, their number of prior arrest, or their residence, and spits out a prediction about the likelihood that your loved one will be arrested for a new crime while on parole. It turns out that this tool that the parole board uses is heavily based on an algorithm that was developed by individuals who had no knowledge of the criminal legal system and who themselves said that this algorithm should not be used in real world environments. Despite these warnings, the parole board decides to go ahead and use the algorithm as a basis for their tool, ultimately allowing your loved one's fate to be determined by a flawed risk assessment. Recently, the National Institute of Justice allowed a situation like this to potentially come true through a challenge that they issued. I want to take a little bit of a step back and let you all know what our paper is about on a broad sense. So our paper focuses broadly on the use of predictive tools in the criminal legal system. And these types of tools have been used to do a myriad of things, but some of the most common uses include to inform decisions about whether people should be held in jail for a trial, to determine the length of people's incarceratory sentences, and to attempt to estimate a person's likelihood that they would recidivate. And our paper focuses on this third bucket, the use of predictive tools to predict recidivism. Importantly, the use of these tools has not been without criticism. While this is not an exhaustive list, some of the critiques of these tools have been that they're not really accurate typically for folks across different races. The data used to build these tools is often inaccurate and biased. Often faulty and insufficient proxies are used to measure recidivism. The evaluation criteria for these models is often insufficient. And these types of models often don't work well in the real world and ultimately fail to achieve their goal of serving as accurate uh, measures of recidivism and risk. So in this context, the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the United States Department of Justice, released what they call the Recidivism Forecasting Challenge with the goals to improve the ability to forecast recidivism using person and place-based variables, to encourage non-criminal justice forecasting researchers to compete against more traditional criminal justice researchers, and to provide what they term to be critical information to community corrections departments. So the contestants who participated in this challenge were given the following series of uh, parameters. They were given a data set that had about uh, 25,000 individuals who were released on parole in Georgia between 2013 and 2015. And these contestants had to build predictive models that would predict whether this population of folks would be rearrested for a new crime within three years of their release on parole. They were judged on their models based on a series of fairness and accuracy metrics. And all in all, there were 26 winners who won a collective total of $723,000 in the prize money. While this challenge was heralded by the NRJ, a successful effort that demonstrated the power of open data and open competition, in reality, the challenge was marked by some serious and fundamental flaws. And I think one of the winning papers really encapsulated this when they said the following. We are hesitant to accept any insights gained from submitted models and question the reliability of performance we would also discourage the use of any submitted models in live environments. So in our paper, we wanted to understand how a contestant could come to a conclusion like the one that you all see on the screen. We decided to focus our critique on the design and specifically the extent to which the design of the challenge adhered to principles of robust participatory design. And one thing I should note here is that the challenge wasn't explicitly uh, set out to adhere to these principles, but in the way that they framed the challenge, there were several characteristics of participatory design uh, uh, sort of evident in their thinking. And this is perhaps like most greatly seen in the way that they wanted to include what they call the diversity of experts to build these kinds of tools and their explicit solicitation of involvement from non criminal justice researchers. 
All right. So, uh, you know, what went wrong with this contest, right? And we're really glad, actually, that we're uh, we're very good at the making before us because it's sort of like a case study in participatory design um, methods and using participatory design framework. So, <clears throat> what is participatory design? Uh, in our case, we examined it through uh, looking at how stakeholders were considered and engaged through this process. So first, how do you define who should participate in the challenge? In this case, the participant organizers really thought about law enforcement, right? So, you know, this is a challenge by the Department of Justice. They um, engaged with Department of Parole, and they were implementing this challenge in an effort to assist local corrections departments across the United States. Uh, they also thought about uh, participants who were the coders, programmers, designers uh, who would be engaging the process, right? So people who had technical expertise that could look at the status set and create an algorithm. Uh, but there seems like there's an obvious third bucket of people that were not considered in this challenge. Can anybody just shout out who it might be? The people who are interested in release on parole. The people who might be released on parole. <laughs> exactly, right? So we have a data set of 26,000 people who were incarcerated, who had the opportunity to be up on parole. Nobody reached out to them, it seems, really, right? So these are the people who are looking to get out, whose families and loved ones would like to spend time with them. Um, also, these people have public defenders that they probably worked with, defense attorneys, there might be parole advocates who are seeking their release, and there might be reentry advocates in their communities that could have weighed in on this. But it doesn't seem that the challenge actually reached out to those people. Another uh, application of the participatory design, uh, participatory design framework could ask, did you ask any questions about the impacts of participation itself, right? So what are the harms that accrue to the people um, whose data is being used? What are the incentives actually to the people who are participating in the, in the contest? So in this case, you could think, you know, law enforcement people have a way of uh, establishing that their risk assessment methods are more credible, even though it's actually less transparent. Uh, the people who are participating in the program have an opportunity to win a lot of money. And so we said it was almost a million dollars uh, doled out in terms of cash prizes. Another dimension of participatory design is whether there are opportunities to contest the design itself along the way. So can people who are participating say, hey, there's a problem with the way this thing is conceptualized, there's a problem with the data we're using, there's a problem with the way you're trying to deploy this. Are there opportunities like that? So we know that our contestant here, one of the contestants did make this comment after winning a bunch of money, but it doesn't seem like anybody who's actually in that parole category who's up for parole got to participate or um, provide any input. Now, we want to, we've talked a little bit about US um, policy on AI and design, um, and I'll note that yesterday the Biden administration issued an executive order on use of AI in the United States. I really encourage everyone to take a look at that and read it, but just to amplify a few things here. Um, you know, they, the Biden administration issued a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, and they said a few things we should all assume. So one, people should be protected from unsafe or ineffective systems. So that's supposed to apply broadly, right? But if an AI system, an automated decision-making system, or some technology is being deployed on you, you should be able to assume that it's safely being deployed, right? That you're being protected. But are people who are caught up in the legal system and certainly people who are in parole, are they protected from these systems? Second, you should be protected from inappropriate or irrelevant data use in the design, development, and deployment of automated systems. Same question, right? Although that might be broadly true, are people who are caught up in the criminal legal system um, able to do that? We'll move on to the next slide. Should we? Okay, so how does the challenge stack up against these principles? I talked a little bit about, you know, sort of lack of participation of impacted communities and sort of lack of ability to get input along the way. And to put a minor point on it, they really should have reached out to not only the people on parole, but their families and loved ones and their advocates who could have offered a lot of context. So one, they could have offered specific context around where it needs to be incarcerated, what it's like to be on parole and what the factors are. So for example, if you are given a higher uh, risk assessment, you have a higher level of, of uh, supervision, what that means in practice is that you might have to check in with your parole officer several times a week. You might be given the challenge of having to put in like three job applications a week. 
and you may not be able to access the internet while you're trying to do all of these things. So, you know, those are things that I think the programmers here may not have realized when they were thinking about uh, how to assess what kind of a percentage or a high level of supervision and what the riskiness was. Um, we also we also want to flag that you know these people should have been able to give input on uh, the data selection, the outcome metrics, and the weight that input variables were given uh, along the way, but that's not possible. Okay, so what are some other methodological issues with the challenge? So in our paper, we focus on the choice of a faulty outcome variable. In this case, they chose the probability of rearrest, and that's supposed to be a proxy for the probability that you have a your crime. Um, data leakage, feedback loops, and a flawed fairness metric. So here, we really want to pause and focus on um, the choice of a faulty outcome variable. So arrest is not a good proxy for whether or not you've actually committed a crime, right? We're all innocent, we're presumed innocent uh, until we're proven guilty, right? And in this case, you really need to think about arrest as just a kind of like accusation. Um, there's lots of research that indicates that a crime that is an arrest actually tells me more about the police department tactics that you're dealing with. Um, it tells you uh, more about the police officer behaviors that we're engaging with, and sometimes it's a racially biased proxy um, for the citizen. It's also prime type agnostic, uh, but I won't talk too much about that in the interest of time. Go on to the next few variables. Yeah, so another methodological issue that we highlight in our paper is data leakage. So some of the winners of the challenge noted that a couple of the inputs that were given for were actually calculated at the time of the challenge occurred, so in 2020 slash 2021, rather than when individuals were actually released on the roll, so in 2013 and 2015. And the issue with this is that it introduced look ahead bias into the models that were built. Basically, some of these input models gave an indication of the true state of the future that people were being asked to predict in the first place. And so as one of the winning papers noted, essentially any top tier model in this challenge would explicitly or implicitly owe some of its predictive prowess to this leaked information. And so why is all of this important? We argue in our paper that the NIJ, given its positioning within the Department of Justice, has a lot of power to influence and shape how local community corrections departments think about recidivism. And so because of this, this competition that is run in this way and has these flaws in it runs the risk of creating unwarranted legitimacy for risk assessment tools in a criminal legal system. It also can create the proliferation of faulty risk assessment tools in local community corrections departments across the country, which could potentially impact the fact that it's of hundreds of thousands of incarcerated individuals across the United States. And one thing I did want to note here is that we did submit a FOIA to the DOJ to better understand like, how the results of this challenge would be used in practice, but unfortunately, we did not get a response to them. So a couple of recommendations and hopes. If you're ever asked to participate in this kind of challenge or you're thinking about designing one, a few things to think about. Uh, one, did you consult with impacted communities or their advocates when developing this challenge? And within this, really think about, do you need additional expertise to be able to identify who the impacted communities are and the stakeholders are? I take that really seriously when you're thinking about designing those challenges. Um, right, do you need help in understanding about the impact? And, and do the other big question is do the contestants? So often this is like programmers or people with technical expertise that are participating in such a challenge understand the social, political, and historical context in which they are developing predictive tools. So are you only engaging technical experts who don't understand the context of deployment? Um, the other question here, which specifically the criminal legal systems, have you considered uh, how the challenge could provide support for non carceral solutions to uh, prevention of recommission of crimes? So just always think about that. That's always an option. There are many people out there who are developing those alternatives, so it's something to think about. And finally, are you really spending time thinking about the harms to impact communities um, when you're developing these tools, right? Like, could they be harmed through faulty use of data, faulty use of these algorithms? Something you should really explicitly consider when um, you're engaging in these competitions. And with that, uh, thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>
Yeah, I can talk about it a little bit briefly. So essentially, like the the metric that folks could optimize with their models for was like one minus the difference between the false positive rate for black curlies in the data set and white curlies. And in order to determine if someone recidivated in the data set, they had to have a, uh, a probability of recidivating that was greater than 50%. So the majority of the individuals in the data set didn't have uh, that high threshold of having a probability of recidivating, which then meant there were very few false positives. And ultimately, most of the people knew that there was no racial bias in the data set or any of the models, which Anyone who's done research in this space, but that's not true. Like, you should be seeing the bias views, which is given the way that these works. And so, that was, we'll talk about it a little bit more in the but that's essentially the critique of the art. Thank you.